Hello and welcome to the UCD Writing Centre. My name is Dr. Michael Fay, and today we're going to be looking at writing, editing, and proofreading your essay. So, over the next half hour or so, we're going to be looking at structure and editing, creating your first draft, redrafting and proofing, and creating a consistent editorial approach. So the first thing you want to do when you're uh, looking at an essay is uh, you're going to want to think about how to plan it. So you need to know what are the basic ingredients that make up an essay. So essays are basically made up of an introduction, uh, a main body with several themes that answer a particular question, and a conclusion. And if one of those things is missing, you don't have an essay. Uh, I can't count the amount of times that I've received essays uh, from students and they've maybe skipped over certain sections of the introduction or their conclusion is one sentence. Uh, whenever you're in that kind of scenario, it means that you haven't fulfilled the basic expectations of essay writing and that can have a pretty severe impact on your grade. So it's important to think even from the beginning about the really basic stuff that makes up an essay. So your basic requirements once you've received an essay title are to make sure that you understand the question. So double check instructions. Often students will come, up, come into us here at the UCD Writing Center uh, and they'll bring an essay question and they won't have any more information about it. And so we, we generally ask them to, uh, to go onto their Blackboard account or, or Moodle account, their virtual learning environment. And normally we'll find um, a, a, a sheet that's been uploaded by a tutor that has significantly more information than just an essay title, usually some recommended sources or some bullet points that kind of detail the expectations of the essay. So it's always a good idea to, to double check that you have all your instructions uh, from the, from the get-go. You should also pick out the key terms in your essay question. If there's any theoretical vocabulary in there, any particular ideas that you need to understand, just make sure that you, you take a bit of time to understand them, that you make a few notes about the, the different bits and bobs that you need to learn uh, to, to do the essay properly. You should also then go back to your notes. I mean, you, when, you, when you receive an essay question, you usually uh, th there'll be particular lectures and classes uh, that have the most relevant information for you to be able to do the essay. Um, it's, it's always a very good idea to just take stock, uh, look through your old notes, your, the lectures that you've been to, and pick out the bits and pieces of information that most suit the essay topic. Um, you should also check your style guide and department guidelines. Again, students often come in and we ask them, are you using APA, MLA, Chicago, Harvard style? And often they don't know. Usually this information is either, either your, your, your main lecturer or core tutor will know it, or it'll actually be on your department website. It'll be in the guidelines. So that's, that's usually an easy fix. You just need to ask or check the website. Um, and finally, make sure that your Microsoft Office Word or, or whatever program you're using is set to the correct language. If you're in a UK university, make sure it's set to UK English, American, US uh, English. If you're in a Canadian university, it's, it's Canadian style, right? And, and that's simply because there are different uh, spelling and punctuation conventions. These are the little things that you just want to sort out at the beginning uh, so that you're not worrying about them at the end. So once you've fulfilled those basic requirements, you can begin thinking about visualizing your options. So the visual that we have on screen here is just sort of a, a, an options plan, if you will. So you can do this if you want. You can, you can just put an essay title on a piece of A4 paper, put it on a table in front of you, and you can, um, you can just use sticky notes around that piece of paper to kind of just get a, get a nice visual, a nice broad plan of what you might want to address. You can do it on a whiteboard, whatever you want. Here, obviously, it's just on a computer screen. Um, so you put your essay title in the middle, in the top right hand corner, aims of essay. So you will obviously have a title that will, you know, there are expectations around fulfilling the, the, the demands of a, of a particular essay title. Uh, but you'll have your own aims in order to, to be able to do this. So put down a couple of aims that you think might speak to the essay title. It doesn't have to be perfect at this stage. It's nice to be quite broad uh, so that you can kind of narrow this down um, a little later on. You should put your relevant lecture and tutorial notes uh, in the bottom right hand corner there. So that's just basically any notes that you think are particularly good, any particular lecture uh, that you attended uh, that, that had a lot of useful information that you think will, you'll be able to plug into this essay. You should just make a note of it uh, and put it in the bottom right hand corner. In the bottom left you can see possible section headings. So in our next slide we're going to be looking at um, an essay layout uh, template. Um, these subheadings uh, you'll use these to, to sort of embed your essay narrative into the structure of the essay. So think of a couple of subheadings uh, that will, if you add them all together, 
answer the demands of the essay title. And start, and start even now just, just putting a few down, having a couple of options that you can come back to later as you begin to kind of write your essay uh, and move from that kind of uh, basic planning and structure stage to the first draft. Uh, and finally, your list of sources in the top left-hand corner. So this is your, uh, your bibliography, recommended sources. Just put a, a short form uh, of, of recommended sources in the top left. So that you're, you're basically, you're keeping everything, uh, you know, pretty much together, but it's still quite general at this stage. It's just something you can draw from so you can really nail down your structure. Okay, so now we can move on to your essay structure template. So um, we developed this template basically because students were uh, finding it very, very difficult uh, to kind of, you know, you, you're, you're faced with the blank page, you're writing your essay, and you're a little bit unnerved about the whole thing. So the point of this template is that you just start filling in information uh, so that you're not, you're not facing into uh, what looks like an insurmountable, um, um, insurmountable task. So, on the first page of your document, you should write introduction, and then followed by thesis statement, aim one, question one, and aim two, question two. On page two, write down aim one, provisional title and points. On page three, write down aim two, provisional title and points. And on page four, write conclusion. So at this stage, you should look at the, your, your, your visual, your, your plan from which you're going to draw information, right? And the first thing you're going to want to do is force yourself to come up with a thesis statement. Now, I know that some people argue that a thesis statement is something that comes a lot later into the writing process. But I think if you're someone who's very, very concerned about structure and narrative and about keep, keeping uh, your essay uh, narrative you know, coherent. It's always a good idea to just start with a thesis statement. It just gives you that sense of argument. It takes you from the title to your, per your perspective on the title, your take on the title. And after all, that's what your marker is looking for. So force a thesis statement. Um, this essay will demonstrate. That's usually what a thesis statement is. It's that, it's that point of the essay where you're, you're giving uh, the specific argument uh, that you're going to cover in your essay. Um, after this, write down your, your two aims. So the first part of this essay will investigate whatever it is you're gonna investigate. Then it will be demonstrated that, and then you just fill that out. So the point of that is that you're taking the information from your visual, you're filling in the blank page. It's all pretty basic at this point. You don't have to have an absolutely brilliantly thought out argument. You're just getting the basics down on the page at the minute. So you don't need to worry too much about it being perfect. Uh, moving on again to page two, uh, you should convert your aim or question one from the per first page into a subheading. So you'll remember in the, uh, when, when, when you visualize your plan, you'll have come up with a couple of subheadings. So have a look again at your plan visual and take a subheading that you think will fit into the essay. So remember, the, the, the two aims that you set up in your introduction. Uh, you want to answer those two aims, and those two aims equal the thesis statement, and the thesis statement equals you answering the question. So a subheading will basically keep you focused. So when you write down the subheading, just put a few bullet points under it. How do you think you might open this particular point? How might you expand it? And how might you conclude it? So four or five points maybe, just at this stage, that you're going to want to cover. You might have a few critics that you want to use uh, under a particular subheading. So it's no harm to write down their names on one of the bullet points as well. You're just basically placing the information in, in the right area. Um, you know what you're talking about, and you know when you're talking about it in your essay. You do the same on page three of your essay at this stage, the same for aim two, it's the same basic principle. And then for the conclusion, of course you don't know exactly how you're going to conclude at this stage. But one or two bullet points that indicate where you think you're going to go, it doesn't hurt. Again, it's about filling in that blank page. It's about having a nice sense of a coherent narrative. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to embed your narrative in your structure and your structure in your narrative. So hopefully at this stage, you'll have been able to do that. So once you've completed the essay structure template, the first thing you do is save it. Save it as essay structure template and leave it in a separate file. Hopefully you won't have to look at it again. Then reopen that file and resave it as first draft. So this is what you're going to be working on from now on to create a first draft. So, the first draft. So at this stage, you need to fill in the knowledge gap. While you were doing your essay visualization and your essay structure template, you will have noticed uh, a few gaps in your own knowledge. That's normal. There's no way you would know uh, every single uh, bit of information that you need uh, to complete the essay. 
So filling in the knowledge gap is, is just a standard uh, uh, part of a first draft. So first of all, create a working bibliography. That is a list of sources that you know you'll have to use in order to answer the question. When you're reading these sources, read actively. That means using pen and paper or stylus. Uh, if you're someone who articulates points better than you write them down, perhaps you'll want to record your thoughts on a particular uh, piece that you've read. That's totally fine, whatever works for you. Never underline, make a note instead. So if you see something really interesting, don't just highlight it and, note and, and, and underline it. Actually talk about why you found it interesting. So either record that or write it down beside it. And start linking points to other authors and other ideas. So once you've read a couple of sources, you might begin to notice that there are um, links between particular authors, that some authors disagree with others in, in provocative ways. You might notice that you have a particular way of coming at a topic that some authors have missed. This should be written down while you're doing this active reading. You should make a note of this. Uh, it, it all contributes uh, towards filling in the essay in some shape or form. It might turn into one sentence in the final part of the essay, or it might be the breakthrough that you need to really get writing about a particular section. Um, and write your annotation in your bibliography. This really is if, if, if really this is if you have time. If you have a long bibliography, if you're finding it difficult to, to figure out what sources you should be using, take a second and just summarize what one particular uh, um, author says in one or two sentences in your bibliography. And you might begin to realize, well, this isn't quite as relevant as I thought it was last week. So you can just kind of put it to one side. It's not relevant for that essay. You might use it somewhere else. It's all practice. Uh, it's all very, very useful. Um, you can also, at this stage, start putting those sources into the main body. So under a particular subheading, either as a bullet point or even as a fluid sentence, like if you've been able to summarize someone's point uh, coherently, just uh, put that into the document at the moment. Uh, we're still just positioning the information in the correct order. We're not quite onto the stage where we're actually writing it, writing um, a fluid narrative with paragraphs, etc. So just when you have read one or two sources and you think they're useful for a particular section, summarize how you're going to use them under the section heading. Uh, and it'll just be very, very useful for when you're writing the essay later, instead of you just plucking information from a random document. Um, this also will prevent you from just kind of using block quotations from critics, which doesn't always look good. If you, if you, have a, if you, have, if you use far too much critical quotation, it often looks like you haven't quite understood the topic. So it's a good idea to be able to summarize in your own words. Okay, so once you've kind of covered what you need to know, you can start looking at your introduction again. So what you can see on screen here is a checklist for an introduction. So you need an opening statement or overview of the field. You need to make a comment on this statement. You need to put it in context or even use a quotation from another critic. You can then integrate your thesis statement. This isn't necessarily one sentence, by the way, but it's a way of positioning your argument in relation uh, to the field and in the context of another critic. This is followed by a very brief essay outline. And if you want, you can have a final sentence that acts as a link to your opening paragraph. Now, this isn't always necessary. So for example, if you're writing an essay on the uh, links between Fordism and post-Fordism in contemporary business practices, you might need to do a brief paragraph just after the introduction that defines a couple of complex terms and how they relate to each other. So that's when you might want to use a final sentence that acts as a link sentence, because you're just trying to point out that this paragraph is setting up the rest of your argument. So it might look something like, in order to articulate the points that have been outlined, it is first necessary to give a brief definition of Fordism, post-Fordism, and how they operate in contemporary business. Something as simple as that, right? OK. So what you can see here is uh, an, an essay that's obviously gone through more than one draft, but the reason I'm showing this to you now is that I want you to understand where you need to get to uh, to write a coherent essay. So this essay follows the checklist that I've just outlined. So you can see there's an opening statement and overview. Literary critics adopting world systems and world ecology approaches towards environmental criticism have recently argued for comparative reading of the aesthetic registration of commodities in different geographical settings. It's an opening statement, overview. It's clear and it's concise. Then we have context and criticism. Sheree Deckert has highlighted structural homologies, while Michael Niblett has suggested it is the contours of the world system, etc. So that opening statement has been put in context using other critics. Then we have the thesis statement. Following these interventions, 
This essay argues that literary depictions of fishery frontiers speak to more than just an overfishing crisis, but a general consciousness of capital's inherent contradictions. That's the thesis statement for this particular essay, and it's followed by an essay layout. The first part of this essay suggests the second part will draw out, the final section will articulate. And those are the kind of sentences that you want to have in an introduction. It's nice and clear, and it sets you up really, really well for the rest of the essay. So once you've run through that introduction checklist, you can start turning your bullet points into linked paragraphs. So the example here comes from an article written about uh, fish and oil in Newfoundland. So as of 2015, the oil and gas industry accounted for 16.7% of GDP in Newfoundland and Labrador, with only 7,000 employed per year in the industry since 2016. The inverse of the former cod fisheries, high employment to low GDP ratio. So in an essay structure template, this would have looked like a bullet point that maybe said something like 16.7% of GDP, but 7,000 employed. You just have to turn it into a flowing sentence. This takes practice. So you should always practice with, with your bullet points, different ways of writing that bullet point, different ways of turning it into a sentence until it becomes a coherent point. Also on this uh, slide, if you look at the paragraph break, it says Newfoundland is not exceptional in this dynamic. In this dynamic is in bold, because in this particular context, it works as a link between the two paragraphs. So links and link terms are really important. The argument that each paragraph is a new point is not necessarily true. Often paragraphs will develop a main point as they go. So in this particular case, this second paragraph is developing the point that was made in the first one. And that's why link terms are important. You're just showing a sense of cohesion uh, and a sense of advancement through a point uh, through your paragraphs. So I put a, a, a list of uh, link terms at the bottom here. Furthermore, moreover, having outlined, demonstrated, concurrently, nonetheless. The one thing I'd say about link terms is just make sure that they make sense in the context of your paragraphing. Don't just throw in link terms for the sake of it. Uh, that's just, it's just really important. And it's, it's very obvious to a marker if you throw in a random link term. It doesn't take too much effort to figure out which one fits your, your paragraph. So now you can move on to your conclusion. So a conclusion can feature a brief recapitulation of your argument, a recap of your argument, a reminder of counter arguments, and that one's optional, a rejoinder to these arguments, again, optional, depending on whether or not you decide to remind the reader about the counter arguments, a sentence or turn of phrase that links back to your thesis statement or essay title, and then a strong closing statement. So, this can look a little something like this. As such, the development in form, aesthetics, and character of literary depictions of fisheries at the regional level narrate world historical concerns. A brief recap of what's been said. Combining novels like The Silver Darlings and Sylvanus Now allows us to trace an overall dissatisfaction with fishery management and a development in attitudes, forms, etc. You're linking back to that thesis statement, which you can look at. It was just a couple of slides back in this presentation. And then to end it, you use a strong closing statement. The narratives thereby suggest little in terms of possible cultural evolutions for a revitalized fishery, but through silver and oil, mediate the sense of impending violence that awaits communities at the frontier. Closed. Sometimes people kind of say to people, a conclusion is just a summary of what you said. It's not. You should just follow this pretty easy checklist. Recap, link to thesis statement, strong closing statement. It looks a lot better, and it should lead to, to better marks. For those of you who've been struggling with marks, if, if people have been talking about issues with your conclusion, this should help you out. So again, just complete the essay narrative. Keep inputting link sentences, keep working on your sentences, experiment with different ways of turning particular bullet points into paragraphs. Just, you're constantly writing, basically. At this stage, you can remove your subheadings. Sometimes, and in some disciplines, they do like you to use subheadings uh, as, as you move through different points. Uh, and sometimes it's an option that you, can, that you can use or not. Entirely up to you, but at this stage you can remove your subheadings. Modify your thesis statement. You're going to change your thesis statement a good bit during the writing process. At this stage, if your thesis statement is the same as it was in your original plan, there's a chance that the thesis statement may not be adequate 
for an essay title. So if you get this far and your thesis statement hasn't changed too much, it wouldn't do any harm to run it past a core tutor, lecturer, uh, or a couple of colleagues, just to make sure that it's, it's, you're actually saying something about the essay title. And then you can check your introduction and conclusion against your checklist. So you're just rechecking that checklist again. Uh, and then turn all your points into sentences. Consider if an overall argument has been made. Again, this, this is the, the, the essay narrative stage. Uh, you're, you're just constantly checking to make sure that there's a sense of narrative, there's a sense of structure, there's points being made in each paragraph, all this kind of stuff. And finally, run a spell check. You know, you go into the review tab of a Microsoft Word document, hit spell check, and make sure that everything's in spell correctly. And that's a first draft. And that's probably the hardest part of essay writing. So if you've gotten this far, you've done very, very well. So now we move on to copy editing. So copy editing runs in three stages. The first thing you want to do is go through an editorial checklist, which I'll run through now in a couple of seconds. You then want to create a consistent editorial guide. So an editorial guide is a list of stylistic features and uh, ground rules for spelling and grammar that you use in your essay. So I'll go through that in a couple of minutes. And finally, you'll want to color code and make comments about further revisions that you might want to do either in this draft or in a later third draft. It depends on how many revisions you have, basically. So the checklist. The first thing you want to check for is spelling errors, then repetition of phrases and duplication of words, passive voice, your tenses, make sure your tenses match. Subject verb agreements, tautologies, weak adjectives, overuse of italics, commas, and colons, and consistency for that editorial guide. So for now, I'm just going to focus on passive voice, tautologies, and weak adjectives. So passive voice versus active voice. Active voice, the subject performs the action, passive voice. The action is performed upon the subject. So here's an example of a passive. The information was known by many students. An example of active. Many students knew the information. So the active voice is useful because it's a much more direct writing style. And it often makes it much easier to comprehend complex points, particularly if you have, if you have a, a long-running sentence or a couple of sub-clauses. Keeping it in the active voice just makes it easier to understand. Now, some subject areas do prefer passive voice to give a sense of objectivity. So if you are working on phrases that are in the passive and you're putting them into the active voice and you feel that this doesn't look like the articles that you've read, that the style doesn't seem to match what you've seen of your subject area, just run it by your lecturer or core tutor. Um, they always have the, the final word on these sorts of things. Weak adjectives and tautology. So tautology, saying the same point in different terms. Weak adjectives, non-specific terms. So here, here's the example. The results of this study are interesting as they suggest that empirical methods are not suited to this particular process. I mean, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that sentence, but it can be more direct and it can be clearer by getting rid of the weak adjectives and the tautology. So the results demonstrate that empirical methods have no practical application in this process. So this particular is a tautology because it's just, it's a redundant phrase, basically. It's enough to say uh, uh, no practical application in this process. So checking for tautology and weak adjectives make your points more specific. So at this stage, you can now confirm your master editorial guide. You've run through that full checklist, and you've spotted the errors and, and uh, stylistic uh, incongruencies that you need to fix uh, throughout your essay. So what does an editorial guide look like? It looks something like this. In the first section, you have your style. So double-spaced Times New Roman. Prefer I-Z-E, I-Z-A, Z-I-N-G endings. That's instead of I-S-E, I-S-A, S-I-N-G endings. Uh, Oxford comma, but UK spelling. So this particular person decided that they like to use the Oxford comma, but that they are using other UK spelling and grammar conventions. That's totally OK, because they're keeping it consistent. If you ever have any concerns about style, 
and you have a particular preference for using something that maybe isn't recommended in your department guidelines, just run it by your lecturer. They might be happy enough for you to, to use one or two conventions outside of their own, as long as it's consistent and it makes sense. If you look at spelling and grammar, this term Bildungsroman is Roman, initial cap. So Roman basically straight as opposed to the, the, the italics. Uh, initial cap, so Bildungsroman always with a capital B. So in literary studies, you often see Bildungsroman spelt in different ways, sometimes in italics. This particular person, Bildungsroman, was used a lot in the essay, and they felt that italics uh, just drew too much attention to the term, so they decided to do an initial cap instead. So it's a fair uh, spelling and grammar point. It doesn't uh, go against any particular style guide. That's the sort of stuff that you want to make, uh, make a note of in your editorial guide. Now you can start thinking about revising your sentences. So here's an example of a revised sentence between the first draft and the second draft. So a first draft sentence. The number of nurses who are actually leaving Ireland at the moment has been demonstrated clearly by qualitative studies which suggest that their leaving was triggered because there are no jobs. So someone's looked at this sentence, they've experimented with different ways of writing it, they paid attention to their copy editing checklist and they've come up with something a little better. Qualitative studies demonstrate that the number of nurses leaving Ireland at the moment felt that they had to because of bad employment options and wages. This second draft sentence is by no means perfect, but it is an improvement on the first sentence. The unnecessary qualifier is removed. Unnecessary words are removed. The passive voice has been replaced with active voice and the gerund has been replaced. So it's a much more direct sentence. The same goes for quotations. Often, particularly with undergraduate essays, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to engage with critics. Uh, it can be a little bit intimidating to summarize their points and use them to back up your own point or to refer to them in your writing. It's just something that takes a lot of practice. So a first draft might look something like this. There is a connection between masculinist violence and environmental destruction in literature. Val Plumwood argues, quote, dualism has formed the modern political landscape of the West, end quote. Naomi Klein writes that even in the contemporary moment, quote, press reports rarely make the connection between violence against women and violence against the land, end quote. There's nothing wrong with this, particularly for a first year essay, this is quite good, but you're always trying to improve your ability to uh, engage with critics. So second draft, or later drafting, might give you something like this. The literary registration of masculinist violence and environmental destruction corresponds to the contemporary identification of resource extraction as inherent to capitalist patriarchy, Western dualism, gendered violence, and land destruction. So it's one sentence, it's clear, and you've managed to include all of the critics in it. So it's in your own words, and it allows you to set up an argument on your own terms. Okay, so at this stage, I want you to give this a go. Revise the following paragraph from a first draft piece, proofread it, make the argument clearer, and create an editorial guide. So just remember, there's no single right answer for this task, just like there's no single way to write a great essay. But hopefully, the editorial guide that you come up with will look a little something like the editorial guide that I'm going to show you in the next slide. So, one of the most useful things about search engine technologies is their many uses. Though internet usage is prevalent today, many people still struggle with organizing information that they find online. Furthermore, internet sources themselves are not always trustworthy. This is because some people lie about the things they put up online, coloring the message. What you believe may not be the same as what your neighbor believes, which is fine, but people need ways of knowing what they are looking at. Numerous creative technologies exist to help this problem. So, pause this video for 10 minutes and just run through the stages that we've talked about across this presentation. Okay, so a revised version. Though internet usage is prevalent today, many people still struggle with organizing information that they find through search engines. Furthermore, internet sources are not always trustworthy as the content is often colored by competing beliefs. While engaging with different points of view allows people to refine their own ideas, separating fact from fiction online remains difficult. To alleviate issues around spurious content, entrepreneurs have created numerous fact-checking programs. So the reason I've read those out is that you can actually hear that the second version, it actually sounds better than the first version. It's by no means perfect. There's a couple of points in this that I wouldn't be completely happy about. But as a second draft, it's an improvement, and that's what matters. 
Um, you can see the style guide at the bottom of the page. So, spelling and grammar, internet, always capitalized. In the uh, first version of this, internet was spelled with a lowercase i and uh, a capital I. So this person has decided to capitalize internet across their document. Uh, UK Irish spelling, color, neighbor. In the first document, this person spelled color C-O-L-O-R, which is a US convention, but they were writing in UK style. So again, something to note down in their editorial guide. Um, and fact checking, this person has decided to put a dash whenever they say fact checking. Again, it's fine, just making a point to make sure it's all consistent as you write the essay. In terms of style, it's MLA, and in this case, single spacing. So hopefully your editorial guide will look a little something like that. Okay, so at this stage, you can look at your bibliography. Um, so in this sample bibliography, you'll see that this person has printed it out, uh, and they've actually marked it up uh, with, 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 you know, on pen and paper. Maybe you're a little tired from using the computer screen, that's fine. I just want to uh, call your attention to the Kybert quotations. You can see here that this person obviously was going to use several different articles from this person, but has ended up only using one. So they've made a note to combine uh, the, the, two the two complete citations there. So just a point. At the end of your second draft, you should be making sure that your uh, bibliography reads as it should. So the new draft. Again, rewrite your thesis statement. Make sure your introduction sets out your aim clearly. Check your linked sentences. Is the essay as a whole coherent? Do the in-text citations or footnotes match the bibliography? If you moved around information or restructured sections of the essay, does the whole piece come together? Is your conclusion linked to the wider topic? Don't just conclude by rewording an essay question in the affirmative. And then you run a full proofread. And that's the second draft. The third draft is much shorter than the previous two drafting processes. You may need to redraft one or two highlighted sentences. I mentioned that you should highlight sentences that you're finding particularly difficult during the second draft stage. Just check these sentences against your editorial guide and run a spell check. Check the overall fluency of the uh, piece one more time, just reading it through, making sure everything is in place where it should be. And then proofread it again. Make the copy as clean as possible. And then you've got to print it, proofread the printed version, and read it aloud as if delivering a presentation. This will allow you to kind of hear the inconsistencies. You'll be able to hear the sentences that aren't structured properly. If you end up redrafting several paragraphs and sentences extensively, you should rerun the three-stage copy edit. Usually, it just takes an extra day. It's not that big a deal, but it means you won't be submitting your third draft. You'll be submitting a fourth draft. Again, it only takes an extra day, usually. So we're back to revising sentences. So we've seen these two sentences before, and as I mentioned, that the, the, the second draft sentence still wasn't perfect. So this person has had another look and they've redrafted it as such. Qualitative studies demonstrate that high levels of nursing staff are leaving Ireland due to poor employment prospects, citing low wages and unsuitable working conditions. And as you can see, there's now uh, two citations, two, critics, uh, two critical pieces have been mentioned. So it's a much more coherent sentence and it's also referencing secondary material. So uh, it's, it's, it's very much a sort of final draft kind of sentence. So, to summarize the key stages, in your first draft, you plan and structure, fill in the knowledge gap, rewrite your introduction and conclusion, you link your paragraphs, and you proofread. In the second draft, you copy edit, do your editorial checklist, make sure you revise your sentences, confirm your editorial guide, and have a look at your bibliography. And then the third draft, it should, it should be just minor revisions, make sure you're just checking the consistency of the overall essay, and then a final proofread and bibliography check. And if all of that runs through, if there's only one or two minor changes in the third draft, you can proofread your final submission. Print it out, give it a proofread, and if it's good to go, it's good to go. So, final points. Give yourself plenty of time. Ideally, you should take four to five weeks to write an essay. Now, don't panic if you only have two or three weeks. You can still run through these stages. It just means that you might have to spend a couple of more hours than you originally planned on the essay. Um, be rigorous with your style guide, editorial policy, and drafting. No shortcuts. Run the three-stage copy edit. Run your proofreads. Make sure you do it. it it'll just save you uh, a lot of frustration. If you, get, if you end up with a lower grade than you deserved, uh, you'll be pretty annoyed at yourself for not running one of the stages of the proofread, for example. 
Uh, make sure you are within word count. Lecturers might allow a deviation of a few percent, but this is not always the case. If you go a good bit over, often a good idea to shoot your lecturer an email. Just check if it's okay. They might say no. They might want you to bring it back. If that's the case and it's your third draft, you're going to have to do another draft, a fourth draft, within word count. And just, I suppose, to mention again, you'll redraft your introduction more than any other section of your piece. This is totally normal, nothing to worry about. Introduction should change as you write an essay. And finally, essay writing rarely goes in set stages, so you might find yourself editing different paragraphs concurrently, especially during that first, gra uh, first draft phase. Uh, you might edit the paragraph in one section, then you might go to near the end of the paper, re-edit it, you might move that paragraph. Just embrace it, it's, it's part of essay writing. It doesn't really go in set stages until you get deeper into the second draft and third draft. That concludes our tutorial on writing, editing, and proofreading your essay. For more useful information, videos, and handouts, you can have a look at the UCD Writing Center website. Thanks again for watching.